The BYU football program is continuing to do work in the transfer portal, especially along their offensive line. What does former University of Utah starter Paul Miley bring to BYU? Let's talk about it on today's show. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, your resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. We're very proud to be part of the Locked On Podcast Network. The motto for the network is your team every day. And as such, we are your only daily podcast focused on the BYU Cougars. So thank you so much for making some time to join us here whenever you listen to us. Early morning, late night, afternoons, evenings, no matter what, thank you for your support, whether you're watching, downloading, or listening, no matter how you're consuming it. Thanks for checking it out. All right, a lot to get to ahead on today's show. Let's start off with some big news in the transfer portal. Uh, Well, first thing on the transfer portal, today is the deadline of the winter period for the transfer portal. If guys have not entered their name or have at least applied to put their name into the transfer portal by today, they will have to wait until after spring ball to do such. And that'll be coming up at the end of March. It'll be a two-week window in that period for athletes to enter their name into the portal. Now, those guys who enter their name into the portal today don't have to have had their decision on where they're going to attend their next school done by today. That deadline is actually, uh, there's no deadline for that. All you do is have your name in the portal at this point, and then you can uh, either withdraw your name at any point, or you can announce you're going to your next school at any point in the near future. Now, BYU is continuing to obviously glean talent out of the transfer portal. Uh, Latest coming yesterday by way of the University of Utah. Paul Miley, a former East High star, started 17 games along the offensive line for Utah, is now going to play his final season of eligibility for the BYU football program. Now, on its head, obviously adding a guy with Power 5 experience, especially 12 games of starting experience this past season alone for the Utah Utes that went to the Rose Bowl would, on its head, make you think, okay, this is a big-time opportunity for the BYU football program. And yes, Paul Miley is a fairly accomplished player, a guy who actually most thought was going to play defensive line coming out of East High School. Uh, six foot two, 304 pounds, according to the University of Utah roster. So he is smaller and lighter than a lot of BYU's offensive linemen have been in the recent past. If you look at BYU's offensive line over the past three or four years, to a man, they average probably 6'3 to 6'5 and anywhere between 310 and 340 pounds. That's kind of been the average for BYU's offensive line. That doesn't mean that Paul Miley is not a capable player because, like I said, he has got 12 games of starting experience alone this past season at center for the Utes when they made their run to the Rose Bowl. Also has five other games in his time at Utah starting experience-wise as well as a bevy of other uh, games that he's played in to get plenty of experience. He is bringing a, a whole new level of play to BYU. And I think that this is actually a pretty good addition for BYU. The question I have, and this is my question about where Paul Miley fits in along the BYU offensive line. And I, Jeff Hansen has pointed this out on Cougar Sports Insider. Uh, and I have the same exact question. I think we are of a like mind on this. Now, when you go by pro football focus grades, Connor Pay graded out significantly higher than Miley did this past season, both playing at the center position at the pivot of BYU. Use or uh, BYU's offensive line for pay, Utah's offensive line for Miley. Now, does that mean that you're going to come in and immediately move Connor Pay to guard, or you tell uh, a guy like Paul Miley coming in, you know what, we already have our center, you're going to play either guard spot or compete at that position for playing time? I think that it'll be a little bit of a musical chair situation in spring ball for BYU. As many as all five offensive line positions when BYU faces off against Sam Houston State this September could have a new face starting in those positions. I could very easily see a situation where you have Kingsley Skumatia lined up at left tackle, moving over from right tackle this past season. At left guard, Connor Pace slots over to play the left guard spot at 6'5", 310 pounds, or whatever he's listed at on the BYU roster. You put Paul Miley in there at center to take advantage of his quickness and his ability, where he's more technically adept probably at the center position. And then at right guard, you play, you got a plug-and-play option at a guy like Ian Fitzgerald out of Missouri State, Lee Solitai, the junior college transfer from college this past year and then at right tackle 
Is Braden Kime factor in? Is Ian Fitzgerald an option out there at right tackle? You have a pretty nice uh, core of guys for BYU's offensive line to look at. So my biggest question about Paul Miley's addition is where he ultimately is going to compete for playing time. He has played at both guard spots as well as a, a short stint, I believe, at tackle as well for the Utes. So he has played every position along the offensive line during his time at the University of Utah in an effort to find the best po position for him. And they took advantage of that by putting him at center. His lack of height at 6'2 is obviously a lot of playing the interior of BYU's offensive line. And at 304 pounds, uh, it seems like he's a little light uh, to be competing for what I would consider to be significant time at guard. So it's very natural in my mind that Paul Miley is coming in and is going to at least compete for playing time at center. He is not coming in with the thought of being just a guy who's going to sit on the bench. I think he is fully intent on using the spring ball period to establish himself in the BYU hierarchy at, at offensive line in the two deep and establishing, establishing himself hopefully by the end of spring ball as a guy that Daryl Funk, BYU's offensive line coach, has decided, you know what, I think I have to pencil him at, in it as a starter at whatever position. The other thing about this, and everybody I've talked to up at Utah about Paul Miley, is that he is a culture guy. He is going to come in, and he's going to help BYU's culture get established or reestablished, however you want to term that, because he is just a guy similar to a Houston Haymuley who is just a good dude to have on your roster. He is good-natured, gets along with his teammates, plays hard, and the best part is he just he fits in with the program. He wants to do his absolute best. He's a program guy first and foremost, and you can never have too many of those guys competing for you along an offensive line like BYU. So I think this is a very, very savvy pickup for BYU. Now, I also need to issue this word of caution. He has dealt with numerous injuries, most particularly lower body, foot, ankle type deals during his time at Utah. That is what, what has kind of knocked him out of uh, starting more games than just the seven he started for the Utes. If those injury concerns are in the past and he's able to show that he's capable of holding up for the for the BYU football program, there's no reason to think he can't go out there and be a starter for BYU this fall. But he has to prove his capability along BYU's offensive line to pick up their scheme, be able to run that zone run concept that BYU likes to run so heavily in the run game in particular. He's got to, be able to show he's adept at, at pass. Uh, what am I talking? Pat. Um, uh, about pass blocking. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, sorry for the stumbling over my word there. But uh, and he also has to show that, like you said, the 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 ability, the best ability is availability. And when you're injured and you have injury concerns, that is something you also have to prove to your coaching staff that you can be counted on when they need you out there on the football field. But all in all, I think this is a very savvy pickup for Utah, uh, for, not for Utah, for BYU from Utah, getting Paul Miley coming down to Provo. And the hope is that he goes out and has a stellar year of great fun final uh, campaign in his collegiate career and hopefully springboards him going on into the NFL. The good news is, uh, and also I forgot about this. I probably should mention this earlier on Waylon Lapuaho. He's also coming in from Utah state with plenty of experience at the guard spot. So he probably factors in as a potential starter there. So uh, I, the thing about this is, is there are many, many bodies for Daryl Funk to work with in spring ball. And I would imagine that anything you hear and or I report out of spring ball about BYU's offensive line, take it with a massive grain of salt because that very much is going to be a period for experimentation. Do you see Waylon Wall at center at one point? Do you see uh, Connor Pay getting time at right tackle? That is the time for experimentation on BYU's roster. I've said it before on this on this show. You're going to see Sol J. Maiava Peters playing running back for BYU this spring. Does that mean he's going to be a permanent addition to the running back position? No, it does not. But BYU wants to see if they can get his versatility and his athleticism onto the football field, and they're going to try it out at the wide receiver position. Tanner Wall, BYU wide receiver, he is moving over to the def defensive backfield in an effort to see more playing time for him. He's a very, very capable receiver, but was just buried behind a bunch of other guys on BYU's depth chart. I say all of that to say this is that Paul Miley will have to compete for playing time, but this is a guy who's got starting experience at the Power 5 level at the very highest levels of the Power 5 ranks, no matter what you think about Utah. They did make that run to the Rose Bowl, my friends. They're back-to-back -back Pac-12 champions, and Paul Miley has started on both of those teams. You cannot discount that experience and his ability to prove himself at the Power 5 level, and that's something why you absolutely can take advantage of as they go into the Big 12 here. Now, 
some of the former guys who will be vacating some of these positions for guys coming in like Paul Miley are making a good impression at postseason showcase events. Also, some pretty high praise for Jaron Hall as he moves on to the NFL, getting ready for the Senior Bowl. Blake Freeland officially announcing he's going to the NFL. We'll get to all those notes here momentarily. First, a word on our friends over at Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all of your sports betting information, stats, news, and analysis. Friends, get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from pro football to basketball, both the NBA and college hoops. Uh, spring training for baseball is not far off. No matter what your interest is, they've got it all at Bet Online. And if you love sports podcasts as well, you can even find those online on Bet Online's website. So check it out. They are the fastest and the easiest way to get your betting information right now. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more now. That's Bet Online, where the game starts. Thank you once again for checking out Locked On Cougars right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. I want to encourage you guys to make your second listen to our friends, our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball. Everything you need to know about college basketball in one place. You'll hear from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. They've got it all. Uh, they do a great job with this podcast. It's Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. All right, officially official that Blake Freeland will be heading to the NFL. Uh, it was only a matter of time before he made that announcement. Uh, he had actually already signed with his agency. I actually saw him put out a thing on social media just about a week ago that he's actually signed with the same agency that Jaron Hall has signed with. So best of luck to Blake Freeland as he moves on here. I think uh, my money, heavy money, if I was betting a betting man, putting a lot of money at bet online. If they had odds on guys being able to be where I think they'd be taken or the guy out of whichever university would be the first taken in the NFL draft. I've got heavy money on Blake Freeland, be the first BYU Cougar to hear his name called this coming April when the NFL draft takes place in Kansas city. He has got all the physical tools, height, weight, length, athleticism, uh, 40 times. I'm sure will be, crazy uh the three cones all that stuff is going to stand out about what blake freeland is capable of doing this is a guy many of you might recall never played offensive line before he arrived to byu but has transformed himself into one of the top 10 offensive linemen in this draft class at the very worst he is very easily in my mind a day two prospect whether it's the second or third round he is going to make a, an nfl franchise very happy whether they put him at left tackle or at right tackle the good news is Last two left tackles for BYU are now NFL guys. Similar to BYU's quarterback position, BYU is back to churning out NFL offensive linemen, and that is a very, very good sign if you're a BYU football fan because now you know what happens with that offensive line recruiting like we just talked about, Paul Miley, Waylon Lapuaho, Ian Fitzgerald, and the like. You can point to those guys and say, guess what? The, the, the last two guys who played your position, speaking of left tackle, are NFL guys. Kingsley Sumatia moving over, that, over to that position whether it's next year or the year after that, he appears to be a guy moving on to the NFL. BYU could be three straight offensive linemen at left tackle being NFL prospects. And what do you have to say if you're a young man who's being recruited by BYU and say, man, they're putting guys into the NFL. Why wouldn't I consider that? That is what BYU needs to capitalize on here as they get ready to go into the Big 12. So uh, I think BYU's got a good thing going here. And congratulations to Blake Freeland as he makes the move to the NFL. Now, Christopher Brooks played his first postseason showcase event. It might be his only one. We had a very, very good showing this past weekend at the Hula Bowl. Uh, you'd think, okay, this game's being held in Hawaii. Used to be, but actually it was held in Orlando, Florida, the home field of UCF, the UCF Knights hosting this. But Chris Brooks had a very, very good performance as Team Kai beat Team Ina 16-13 to in the 2023 Hula Bowl this past Saturday. Uh, the former BYU running back had 101 total yards, 84 of those on the ground as leading rusher in the game. He had 13 carries. That's average of 6.5 yards per carry, which is actually better than his yards per carry average. 6.28 during his one season of BYU. Uh, Brooks looked every bit the healthy running back that we saw early on this season and towards the tail end of BYU's football season. Very, very good sign for a guy like Chris Brooks. Does that mean he's going to be a draft pick? Probably not, but with that performance, their NFL scouts will be paying attention to this, and according to some reports, he's already met with the Washington Commanders. That could be uh, saying, hey, we're interested in you. We're going to continue to track you throughout the pre-draft process. We'll check you out at Pro Day, see what the measurements come back like, and maybe, just maybe, you'll be an undrafted free agent, a priority guy that we will hire after the NFL draft if another team doesn't fall in love with you. The biggest thing for Chris Brooks right now is after having a very, very good showing in that hula bowl, if he doesn't play in another showcase event, he needs to make sure that he aces 
his pro day. Get a good 40 time, get good uh, uh, lateral drills, the agility drills that they'll have you run. Uh, make sure your bench press and weights are as good as you possibly can make them. If he hits the NFL combine the right way, not the NFL combine, the, the pro day for BYU the right way, he can make himself some money, whether it's, like I said, an undrafted free agent or if he slips into the very tail end of the NFL draft, it's money all the same and an opportunity to play at the next level. And could Chris Brooks be like we just talked about two straight left tackles, two straight quarterbacks. You had two running backs in the recent past, Jamal Williams and Tyler Algier go to the NFL. BYU is on a hot streak right now by sending NFL prospects into that draft cycle. And Chris Brooks could join Blake Freeland in doing that. Now, one other name, obviously, it's going to draw interest is Jaron Hall. Of course, BYU starting quarterback the majority of the past two seasons. He left school with eligibility remaining, could have returned for one more season at BYU, but as a guy who served a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, obviously the decision I felt like was made for him to make the jump to the NFL after this season. He's 24 years old. We all know that, but he was uh, highlighted by Chad Reuter from NFL.com as one of the 10 guys at the Senior Bowl coming up at the end of this month as guys to watch at the Senior Bowl. Blake Phelan part of that crew at the Senior Bowl representing BYU as well as Puka Nakua. So a trio of guys getting an invite to the most prestigious postseason showcase event, the Senior Bowl. Everybody and their dog. It's like it's like a miniature NFL combine. Coaches, players, administrators, team owners are all in Mobile, Alabama for this. And it's a huge, huge showcase for Jaron Hall. Now, here's what Reuter had to say. He says, Hall left school with eligibility remaining, but he's a mature 24-year-old, having served a two-year Mormon mission before playing with the Cougars, possessing physical tools to make it in the league. Hall's velocity and tight ball out of the pocket allow him to deliver his first, second, or third read he also shows touch when needed. Hall's a wizard on the move as well, finding downfield angles, racing for big gains. If his ball placement is on point in Mobile, his name will appear on many, quote, risers list after the event. And I would agree with this. I think Chad Raider's right on to something. Jaron Hall has a huge opportunity staring him in the face at the Senior Bowl. He's got to show the ability to get that ball downfield and deliver it accurately, obviously. He's got to be able to show that he has the capability to make plays from both inside and outside the pocket because the NFL puts a premium on their quarterbacks being able to make plays from the pocket. The Russell Wilsons, the Lamar Jacksons, the Taysom Hills, whoever you might think is a guy who makes a play outside the pocket, look at their injury history and tell me that they are going to be long-term options in the NFL. Now, Russell Wilson probably has bucked that trend a little bit, but he is a capable quarterback from the pocket. Guys who play outside the pocket tend to get injured. That's just what the NFL is all about. So his ability, speaking of Jaron Hall, when he needs to improvise, improvise. But if show what you can do from playing in the pocket. And I say that because... I believe that Jaron Hall is more than capable of proving to be a guy who can make plays from the pocket. He did it during his entire career at BYU. There were times BYU's game plan, I don't need to tell you anybody of this that watched anything, there were times that BYU's game plan during this past season and even the previous season in 2021 when Jaron Hall's whole goal was to prove that he can make every throw from the pocket and he was going to be, he was going to be, darned i guess i probably should say he was not going to let himself uh make those improvisational improvisational plays unless he was absolutely forced to move outside the pocket he wanted so badly to prove that he was a pocket aware quarterback the ability to play from that spot on the football field to improve his draft stock that more power to him i hope he goes to mobile and absolutely kills it there it'd be so much fun to see what he's capable of doing out there uh, against some of the nation's best talent, both defense and offense. He will have stellar offensive line, running backs, wide receivers, tight ends, all around him to throw the football to and to protect his backside. But at the same time, he's going to be facing pass rush and linebackers and defensive backs who are the next level of talent. He's played some very, very good teams, and he's carved up many of those teams with his arm. Can he show that once again in Mobile, Alabama, the Senior Bowl? Here's fingers crossed that he can do that because Jaron is more than capable of being an NFL quarterback in my mind. Do I see him being taken in the top three rounds, either day one or day two of the draft right now? No, and the people I have talked to who are far more in the know about this say that he's probably a day four guy, but that doesn't mean he's a seventh round. Pick. They think he's a fourth or a fifth round pick, which is the first part of the third day of the NFL draft. And by the way, that's still plenty of good money. And it's an opportunity to continue to prove yourself at the NFL level. I'm excited for all of these young men. I, I absolutely love the NFL draft cycle. It's actually, in some ways, it's my favorite time of the year because you're watching guys legitimately in real time live their dream. They grew up, like many of us, playing in their backyard, counting down five, four, three, two, one, touchdown. They've lived those dreams, and they and now, excuse me, they have they have dreamed those dreams, and now they're living 
those dreams. And that is my favorite part about this cycle. So I wish Jaron, Blake, Chris Brooks, Puka Nakua, Harris Lachance, on down the list, uh, uh, Peyton Wilgar, uh, whoever it is, all these NFL draft hopefuls, I wish them nothing but the best moving forward and hope they go absolutely out there and kill it because it has a double uh, effect. It helps them and it also helps the BYU football program continue to recruit at a high level because they can now point to many, many faces in the NFL and say, you know what? We developed that guy. Why don't you come here and you be the next guy who can do that out of BYU? That is what BYU is banking on here as they go about uh, building this program. All right. So there you go. Uh, some thoughts on the NFL draft cycle. Now, BYU has continued to do work in the tra in, uh, transfer portal, the recruiting cycle. Uh, a trio of offers went out to prospects in Hawaii as well as one in Texas. I have not had an opportunity as of yet to watch their film, so I am going to uh, actually hold off on commenting on what I see from them until I watch it. I actually have a goal uh, to watch that today, Wednesday, uh, this afternoon. I've got some free time. I'm actually going to sit down, pull up their huddle highlights, and try and glean as much information on each of these young men as I can. We'll talk more probably hopefully more intelligently about those on tomorrow's show. But before we go on today's show, our look back at BYU's independence era there, we are now 12 games in the final regular season game of BYU's 2011 season. BYU made the trip to Honolulu to take on the university of Hawaii rainbow warriors. How did it go? We'll talk about that as we continue on right here on locked on Cougars. First, a word on our friends over at UCCU, though. UCCU is opening a new branch in Vineyard, Utah, my friends. And to celebrate, UCCU is giving away a 2023 Kawasaki Terex 4 UTV. Vineyard is one of the fastest growing cities in the state. We all know that actually one of the fastest growing cities in the country. But the new branches off, branch offers all the benefits of a UCCU branch. Multiple drive-up lanes, a 24-hour ATM, and UCCU's new brand-new interactive teller machines, or ITM for short, which provides all the benefits of meeting with a real UCCU professional either in the branch or right from your vehicle. It's absolutely incredible, my friends. It's in a virtual connection to a remote teller with a highly personalized audio and video connection. So celebrate the new Vineyard UCCU branch. Enter to win that 2023 Kawasaki Terex 4 UTV. The winner will be announced in April, just in time for you to take it out for some summer fun. Stop by UCCU's branch, new branch in Vineyard today, conveniently located right next to the Vegaplex Theaters and Top Golf, or enter to win that Terex 4 UTV at uccu.com. The best part is you don't have to be a member of UCCU to enter, and there's no purchase necessary. That's UCCU. Love where you bank. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. And always appreciate you guys checking out the show. It's so much fun uh, to sit down and talk BYU sports, whatever the news of the day is. But also, as we we're going to close out today's show with, we look back at BYU independent era. And I figured this would be a fun way for us to get ready for the upcoming Big 12 era for BYU by taking a look back at the independence uh, cycle for BYU seasons 155 games and those of you who may be checking this out we've literally gone through 12 games so far looking back at each one of these games and BYU's inaugural season as an independent member now BYU had a rare uh, late season buy on Thanksgiving weekend because they actually had the regular season finale as a road game at Hawaii on December 3rd 2011 now BYU made the long trip to the islands and the big question was going to be, is Riley Nelson capable of playing? And as we have talked about in the previous two editions uh, of this look back at BYU's independent era, he broke his ribs and also had a partially collapsed lung against the University of Idaho three weeks previous to this. The biggest concern was getting him healthy, and the hope was he was going to be available for BYU's bowl game, which was the Armed Forces Bowl, which we'll talk about on tomorrow's podcast. But he actually made a pretty quick recovery and actually came into this game uh, as the question was, okay, is he good enough to play? Well, he absolutely was because he ended up passing for 363 yards and three touchdowns to lead BYU to a 41 to 20, excuse me, 41 to 20 win over Hawaii on Saturday. Now, this game started very, very slowly for BYU. They actually trailed at 13 to 7 before in the second half. They absolutely turned on the Jets, had 296 total yards in that second half and route to 530 total yards of offense and just absolutely obliterated Hawaii. The Rainbow Warriors were pretty desperate in this game because had they won, they actually would have clinched a berth into the Hawaii Bowl uh, to play in this game. But as such, Hawaii fell to 6 and 7 and actually missed out on the postseason while BYU finished their regular season nine and three, a pretty successful campaign 
in their first ever season as an FBS independent. And obviously BYU uh, wanted to go out with the bang and having Riley Nelson back in the lineup seemed to just absolutely ignite what BYU had been going for. Like I said, they finished nine and three and now they were getting ready to head to Fort Worth, Texas to take part in the armed forces bowl. They'd actually find out just a few days after this game, they'd be taking on Tulsa, the golden hurricane in that matchup. And we'll talk about what happened in that bowl game tomorrow, but a couple notes about this Hawaii game is that, like I mentioned, Riley Nelson returned a 25 of 37 in this game, 363 total yards. BYU also ran for 167 yards, only one touchdown on the ground in this game. Brian Correa scoring that touchdown. Cody Hoffman had a monster game, seven receptions, 123 yards. Uh, Hoffman, as we've talked about, during this 2011 campaign showed flashes of what he ultimately would become for BYU uh, in 2012 and beyond. And we'll talk more about that, but it was a very, very impressive victory for BYU and a great way to cap the regular season of their first season of independence. Nine and three. Uh, I remember conversations about BYU going independent. How good can they really do? Could they, can they make a, can they make a run uh, at 10 and two? Could they, or could they sink to six and six? Who knows what the independent era is going to look like for BYU? Well, they finished nine and three. And as we will talk about tomorrow, they had a very famous play call to enter the BYU lexicon coming off of the game winning play in that armed forces bowl. But we'll get to that on tomorrow's show. But all you need to know, BYU finishes season nine and three in 2011 and very successful. All things considered, uh, you had a bench quarterback midway through the season. You insert a guy who just come home off of a mission and Riley Nelson, but he ends up being the guy that you wanted uh, Jake heaps to be and proved himself very capable uh, as BYU's quarterback. So uh, we'll talk about the Armed Forces Bowl on tomorrow's show. As I mentioned, all these offers going out in this uh, contact period, coaches fanning out across the country for BYU. I expect a bevy of these guys to hit the social media with, I've been grateful to receive an offer from BYU. You're going to see a number of those over the coming days. I will do my best to consume as much film of those guys as I possibly can and give you a little more of an informed opinion after watching their huddle highlights and the like to get more of an intel on that. We'll talk about the four guys who recently received those offers earlier this week on tomorrow's show. And it's also a mailbag Thursday edition of the show. And if you want to send in your questions now, please do so on social media. A tweet at us, DM us on social media, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, on Twitter. Love to hear from you guys there. Or email the show. Locked on BYU at gmail.com is the email address if you want to reach out, whether it's questions for the podcast, uh, questions about advertising, no matter what you got, locked on BYU at gmail.com is your destination to send those notes to. All right, that's going to do it for myself. A big thank you for your support, as always. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day. We we'll encourage you guys to make your second listen, our friends over at the Locked On Big 12 podcast. Josh Neighbors does an incredible job talking all things Big 12 football and beyond. And by the way, we're bringing back the Big 12 roundtables. We did these throughout the entirety of last offseason. They are back. We'll be having one of those later this week, so stay tuned for that. Uh, check that out wherever you get your podcast. It's also available on YouTube as well. Once again, this has been the Locked On Cougars podcast. Hope you all are doing fantastic out there in Cougar Nation. And join us back here again tomorrow. This has been the Locked On Cougars podcast. See ya.